Charlotte Heffelmeyer went into her garage to check on her father. When she did, she found that he was pinned underneath the wheel of his truck. Remarkably, Charlotte was able to lift up the truck, prop it onto her hip, and drag her six foot three, 280 pound father to safety. Oh yeah, did I mention the truck was also on fire? Many of us are familiar with stories such as these. Stories where humans exhibit what seem like superhuman capacities in response to extreme situations. But of course, what Charlotte did wasn't actually superhuman at all, and it wasn't induced by anything as fantastical as being bit by a radioactive spider. Instead, Charlotte's ability to save her father was directly influenced by activation of the stress response, an evolutionarily conserved system which has evolved over great amounts of time in order to allow organisms to respond adaptively to stress exposure. So when an organism is exposed to stress, such as being chased down by a predator or giving some sort of public talk, stress hormones are released and surge throughout the body with a number of different types of effects. They allow us to think more clearly, it enhances our memory, and blood travels quickly throughout our body, going to our muscles in anticipation for their use. But we humans, being the complicated creatures that we are, have found a way to actually overburden this system. So one of the unique things about humans is that the mere anticipation of stress is enough to activate our stress hormone response. So what this means functionally is that all the times that we stay up at night thinking about that talk we need to give, our bills that we need to pay, or how few uh, likes our most recent Facebook post got, all of these things have the capacity to activate the stress hormone response. And in doing so, it can actually facilitate the overactivation of stress hormones, which in turn has really maladaptive effects on our biology. And so one of the ways to visualize this is to think about taking the game of operation and setting it atop a pinball table. So normally there might just be one pinball going around in the game, but when we have too many stress hormones surging throughout our body, it's like having 20 pinballs, and they're all surging around and running amok with our innards, leading to the overstimulation of the different things, such as our arteries and our brain, that they're meant to actually helpfully stimulate. So given the wide range of effects of stress hormones in our body, it shouldn't be surprising to know that when we have too many stress hormones, it can lead to a broad range of health effects. Everything from increasing risk of developing anxiety, depression, digestive problems, heart disease, sleep problems, weight gain, and even memory and concentration impairment. So the first point I want to leave with you all is this, and it is that chronic stress is bad for your health. But there's more. Stress can actually occur across the life course, and as it turns out, when you experience stress, it can actually have really substantial um, impacts on how your biology is affected. So it probably wouldn't surprise you to know that stress experiences in adulthood and in childhood impact adult health. However, we now understand that stress experiences in infancy and even prenatally, that is to say before you're even born, can actually influence your adult health. And as it turns out, these prenatal stress exposures may have even greater impacts on your health than those that occur later. So in my research, I've been really interested in trying to explore this question of whether or how prenatal stress experience may actually shape offspring predisposition to developing poor health. And in order to do that, I went to Auckland, New Zealand, where I recruited a group of socioeconomically and ethnically diverse women to try to understand how variation in maternal stress experiences could relate to maternal stress hormones in pregnancy and offspring stress hormones after birth. So when you're a stress researcher, something you realize pretty quickly is that everyone experiences stress. However, the types of stress that we experience actually vary quite a bit. So in order to give you an example of how stress experiences varied amongst my participants, I wanted to go ahead and tell you three of their stories. So one day, I started in central Auckland in a relatively affluent suburb, interviewing the wife of a pastor. In terms of material situations, this woman was in a relatively well-off position. However, her first birth had actually been quite difficult, and she was worried about how this next birth was going to go as a result. She told me she'd been YouTubing cesarean section videos and getting herself increasingly worked up and worried about how her birth experience was going to proceed. Later that day, I traveled to South Auckland where I interviewed a Samoan immigrant. This woman, despite having a, earned a college degree in Samoa, was unable to work in New Zealand because they wouldn't recognize her degree there. 
So despite all the stress she felt around not being able to work, she said that she wanted to remain in New Zealand because she felt that her children would have better educational opportunities there than they would back in the islands. Before going home that day, I interviewed a Tongan woman who told me that she lived in a household of 24 and confessed that at mealtimes, the household size often swelled to 29. So again, the point of sharing these experiences is to highlight the fact that stress experiences vary widely. But what's interesting is that not all types of stress experience impact physiology in the same way. So in my own study, what I found was that of all the different types of stressors that women reported, those that were most strongly associated with stress hormones were poverty and racial discrimination. And as it turned out, women who were poor and those who experienced more racial discrimination had significantly higher stress hormones in pregnancy and gave birth to infants who had significantly higher stress hormones as well. If we think about what I talked about earlier, about how higher stress hormones are associated with the development of poor health, what these findings suggest is that some individuals may be predisposed to developing poor health as early as birth. So the second point I want to leave you with is this, and it is that sensitivity to stress begins prenatally. In other words, the stress experienced by the mother can actually have intergenerational effects. And interestingly, there's actually an evolutionary basis for this observation. If we think about it, maternal environmental experience across her life course shapes her biology in pregnancy. And maternal biology in pregnancy, in turn, directly shapes the environment in which the baby's growing and developing, and thus the baby's resultant biology. So we think about it, maternal biology in pregnancy acts as an integrated signal, linking maternal environmental experience across her life course with her children's biology. What's also interesting is that these effects don't appear to be limited to humans, and my favorite animal example actually comes from the snowshoe hare. So for the snowshoe hare, the most important source of stress isn't poverty, but instead, predator density. And what scientists have found is that years where there's more predators, specifically lynxes, hares who are pregnant have higher stress hormones in pregnancy, and then give birth to offspring who have higher stress hormones after birth. So again, consistent with these sorts of findings I talked about before in New Zealand. What's more, if we actually take a step back and look across different vertebrate species that all share this common stress physiology architecture, so comparing humans, non-human mammals, fish, birds, and reptiles, we see that there's actual general sensitivity of offspring to prenatal stress across all these different species, wherein organisms who are exposed to stress prenatally tend to have changes in their stress hormones and altered behavior in response to the stress experience. And what this common finding suggests is that this might have actually been selected for in evolutionary time, that it might confer some sort of adaptive benefit, and that's why it's shared across all of these species. What I think is actually the most illuminating um, comparison to make, though, is to compare the types of stressors that are studied in the human and non-human animal literature. So in the non-human studies where they're ecological, that is to say outside of the laboratory, the most common type of stressor that's studied is predation risk, as I talked about with the hare. And in this case, if you're exposed to a lot of predators prenatally, if you know that's the type of environment you're going to be born into, it makes sense to have elevated stress reactivity, as it might allow you to be more vigilant in the face of this dangerous environment you'll be living in. However, if we look at the types of stressors that, that are studied in the human studies, things like poverty, discrimination, 9-11, the Holocaust, these are stressors for which increased stress reactivity doesn't necessarily increase survival. And so what we're left with is the evolution of a stress physiology pathway that evolved in the context of qualitatively different stressors that's now being activated in response to these very different types of exposures for which elevated activity doesn't necessarily increase survival, but instead just increases our risk of developing poor health. So this leads me to the final point I want to make for you today. In order to do that, I need to introduce one more concept. And this concept is what's known as the social gradient health. And this is the observation that, both within and between societies, individuals who are socially disadvantaged tend to have poor health outcomes and shorter life expectancies than individuals who are more socially advantaged. So this observation has been made for many years, and initially it was thought that these differences might reflect inherent genetic differences between groups. But if we think about these results I've been talking to you about today, the fact, for example, that individuals who are born into poverty um, or whose mothers experience racial discrimination are more likely to have higher stress hormones, and those higher stress hormones in turn predict the development of chronic disease, 
What this suggests is that the social gradient in health may actually be shaped by this differential exposure to stressors across society. So the final point I want to leave you with is this. And this is that differential exposure to chronic stress can shape patterns in he of health and disease in contemporary society. Specifically, the disproportionate exposure to stressors among the most socially disadvantaged individuals within our society can shape the social gradient in health. So, now that I've sufficiently depressed you all, no one said stress research is fun, <laughs> I do have two practical points I want you to take away from this. The first is at an individual level. If we consider the evolutionary context within which the stress physiology system evolved, it suggests that when we get stress, we get all this energy. And therefore, the most productive thing we can do with that energy is probably something like exercise, instead of perhaps assuming the fetal position and binge watching Netflix. <laughs> Second, at a societal level, I think it's very important that we work to understand the interpersonal and institutional pathways through which differential exposure to stress occurs. And then we need to work to reduce the exposure of stressors to the most vulnerable members of our society. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>